Welcome to the first webcast for this class on the applications of the Gamut Globe Case System for high precision geodesy applications using the GMSS system. I will be presenting this lecture and other lectures will be given by Mike Floyd. We will go into more details in the subjects discussed in this lecture later on in the course. So we start by a brief discussion of GNSS data and the types of combinations of range and phase that we use and some of the aspects of the important ratios of those frequencies, etc. We're then going to look briefly at the modeling of observations. And in particular here, we will concentrate on those things which are not well modeled. And in particular, we'll look briefly at multipath and antenna phase center variations, and also atmospheric delay propagation. Both of these tend to be the types of errors that will affect your positioning when you're doing high precision GNSS work. We'll also look at some of the limitations and the accuracies of GNSS, a brief looking at monument types, a little quick look at a loading just to highlight the impact that it has. We'll have more on that later on in this course. And then orbit quality. How do things change as a function of orbit? And in particular, that in this modern era of GNSS, there are a lot of subtleties in the way orbits are modeled, and that has impacts on your accuracy. And while to a large degree, you can be oblivious of those issues, they sometimes will come in and have an impact on your results. And it's good to be aware of the types of things that will affect you when you're doing processing. Well, we start with some very simple ideas first. And the idea of this lecture is that we briefly highlight those programs in the gamut globe case system and shell scripts that are used to do different types of processing. So the very simplest thing that you can do with GNSS is what's called pseudo range point position. This is what your cell phone uses, your standard car navigation systems, etc. And the idea here is that the satellites each transmit time tagged signals. And then your receiver down on the ground here is able to receive those signals and record the time that it received the signals. If you know the errors in the clocks in the ground receiver, and in the satellites, then you can convert those time differences to a range measurement, and then knowing where the spacecraft are located and the range from a number of satellites, you're able to position yourself down on the ground with an accuracy set by how well you can measure those range determinations. Now in point positioning, the satellite clocks are assumed to be known and they're broadcast by the satellites. And only thing you need to be able to determine is the ground station coordinates and the ground station clock. So typically one considers that four satellites are necessary to do these measurements. In the Gamut Globe Case system, uh, you can get a receiver position. There is a program called Tech, which works with RINEX2 files that is distributed from UNAVCO. Um, you could use that program. And then within the Gamut system, we have the SH. RX, RINEX2 APR, just converts it into a priori coordinates that we can use later on. This is a shell script that actually uses different programs in the shell in the gamut system to do that positioning. The two we recommend for this type of positioning, a program called SHSP3 FIT, which takes a RINEX file and an orbit in an SP3 format, and will give you a position as a point position good to five to 100 meters, depending on uh, when you actually collected the data, and then differential positioning, which again depends on the quality of the data and is typically of order one to 10 meters. This program now handles multi-GNSS, and so you can do positioning with a single GNSS system or a combination of GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, and the Chinese Beidou system. This again is not particularly useful for geophysical applications and is more appropriate for getting started when you want to have an initial coordinate system estimate. 
or to check the quality of data. Sometimes this is useful too. Well, again, once we actually want to do precise positioning, this is when we start using phase measurements. And so again, this is a, just a typical example of how um, GNSS measurements look as a function of time. And you have this very classic look as a satellite's rising, gets to its highest elevation, at which it is at its closest approach to you, and then starts to increase again. These curvature terms are due to just the change in range. At the subtle level, there is differences in here due to the atmosphere and ionosphere, et cetera. You can see in this particular case, there's actually a clock jump, which is common to all the satellites. And that is what we're using to get the receiver clock. The like little dashed lines here are simply measures of a very simple calculation of what we think the range to the spacecraft should be. Now range, as I said, is good to a few meters typically, and sometimes better than a meter. If you really want to use high precision positioning, then you use the phase observables. And for these, you need to be able to resolve essentially the initial starting point of the phase value. And most modern receivers do that approximately for you. So if you were to plot phase data in this type of plot, it would also show these typically 20,000 kilometer ranges out to the spacecraft. Early generation receivers started their phases at zero. So all these numbers would have been approximately at the same location. Now to resolve those phase ambiguities, there's a number of ways to do that. And that's part of kinematic positioning, which we will talk about on Friday. And then in static positioning, we can estimate those values and then resolve them to integers in part of the processing. The longer the session you have, the more the phase changes, and so the better the type of positioning that you're going to get, and the better your ability to resolve those integer phase ambiguities. Data quality also has a major impact on that. And in the GNSS systems, there are intersystem biases that one needs to be concerned about as well. So the basic observables that are used are here. Now this is normally targeted at GPS at the moment uh, and the basic GPS legacy systems. As you go into GNSS processing, you will see that within Gamut um, and our shell scripts now, there is an ability to use other frequencies depending on which GNSS system you are using. All the GNSS systems all work uh, in the basic, what's called the L-band uh, range which is of the water one gigahertz or so. Um, the only non-system, the only system that does not do that is the Indian um, satellite system, which uses S-band. Uh, we are able to process that data in gamut. However, there is very little data available of L-band and S-band um, data. And so it's um, very rare at this point to see any data from that system. So the fundamental frequencies that we use in here are the L1 phase and the L2 phase. And the wavelengths there are 19 centimeters and 24 centimeters. And then we have shooter range measurements. And again, in the subtleties of processing here, these are often classed as P1 or C1, where C1 is the course acquisition code range. And then the P code is the precise positioning code and as many of you are probably aware, with the GPS system, there's an encryption put on the precise position code. And so there's various ways of tracking this higher precision code. And that does have system bias potential when you're doing it. This should all get handled for the GPS system automatically in the um, processing. But it's important that files that tell us how big the bias is between the C1 and the P1 systems be kept up to date. Again, we'll talk more about that later on, is which files you need to make sure you keep up to date if you are processing near real time, within a few days of real time, or actually in real time. So when we take these L1 and L2 data, the biggest contribution you tend to see there is an error after the clocks is the ionospheric delay. And this can be large, it can be hundreds of meters. And at times it can be so variable that it actually affects your tracking. So when we do, high precision processing, we use a combination of the L1 and the L2 phase that refers to an ionospheric free combination. And we do this in gamut, and we refer this to an L1 cycle wavelength. And the ratios you use are 2.5 times the L1 minus 1.98 times the L2. And then for the shooter ranges, it's simply 2.55 
minus 1.55. And again, these two numeric values, they need to differ by exactly one, because if there is no anospheric delay, the P1 and the P2 ranges would be exactly the same. You'll notice also here that these have multipliers on them of 2.5. And so just from a random noise point of view, you realize that when you make this combination, you're going to increase the noise in the measurements by about a factor of three compared to a single frequency measurement. Again, most of the time for long baseline processing, we always use the ionospheric free combinations. Of course, the ionosphere is so large and so variable. However, when you're dealing with short baselines, such as volcanic systems, you might be uh, able to use just single frequency um, results or process with only single frequency or combine L1 and L2 without taking the anospheric combination. Again, we think that is only really valid once you're below about one kilometer separation between your stations. And you always need to be aware that when you do that, the ionosphere is actually quite systematic. It acts like a lens. And so you distort your results whenever you do single frequency processing. Now in gamma, what we use is double differencing to cancel out the clocks between the different satellites. So essentially, since a station can see multiple satellites simultaneously and measurements can be made simultaneously, then if you difference between satellites, the contribution from the ground station clock cancels out. The thing you need to worry about simply is the time at which you made the measurement. And for that, the clock accuracy only needs to be of order about one microsecond. This also um, applies to the ground stations. You can apply it to the satellites as well. So if you see the same satellite from two different ground stations, differencing those data removes the satellite contribution. And that's why it's called a double difference. And so again, these amplify the noise. And sometimes it's worthwhile to process uh, a single frequency data if you're less than about a kilometer away. Now we use other combinations of data and you'll see these terms being used, particularly in programs like TRAC, which gives you some of the details of what is happening in terms of resolving ambiguities, et cetera, but also in programs like AutoClean, which is the program that takes the raw phase data and convert and tries to remove cycle slips and clean up bad data and et cetera, which is passed onto the estimation program. Anyway, we will talk about the combination called LG, which is simply L geared. It's actually the L2 phase minus the L1 phase scaled by the ratio of the frequencies. And so again, a quick calculation would show that if the L1 and the L2 were tracking the same geometric delay, this LG would end up being zero because this ratio is the ratio of the two wavelengths or the uh, signals. We also have the same basic concept, which we tend to use in track, which we call the extra wide line or EX wide line. And it's the same thing, except that L1 is the main frequency as you go through. So this removes all of the frequency independent effects, but um, it still retains impacts from the ionosphere and the multipath signals that are there. Another combination you'll see us widely use and talk about is what's called the Melbourne Wilbur wide lane. This is a combination of pseudo range and phase that actually removes both the geometry and the ionospheric contributions. And this gets dominated by the pseudo range noise. We're gonna come back to this later on, but what the Melbourne Wibbana wide lane gives us a measure of is the difference in the cycles between L1 and L2. And um, we will talk again later on in the week precisely how this actually looks and when it is appropriate to use, but it's, simply defined as the L1 minus L2 phase minus the ratio of the difference between the two frequencies you're using divided by the sum of the frequencies you're using multiplied by the sum of the pseudo ranges. And so for GPS, this ratio is about 0 0.12. And so you can see that this combination actually reduces the noise in the pseudo range. So as I said, for other GNSS systems, we have other frequencies around but they all fit within this basic 19 to uh, 26 centimeter range. And so it's a, uh, the numbers turn out to be very similar between the different GNSS systems that we have. Now, in terms of modeling observations, 
So we're going to take a set of measurements of range and phase from, grab, from the satellites measured down on the ground. And to be able to convert that into a position now, we need to take some very fundamental things into account. We need to account for the motions of the spacecraft. And again, GPNS systems have the advantage that the spacecraft are all very high altitude, at 20,000 kilometers, except for the Beidou system, which also has uh, geostationary and geosynchronous satellites at around 35,000 kilometers altitude. At that very high altitude, the Earth's gravity field is very much diminished in terms of the height spatial wavelength content, and so we can afford to use a fairly low accuracy gravity field in terms of its spatial wavelength. And then all of the low Earth orbiting satellites that are available, such as the Satellite Laser Ranging System, GNSS tracking of low Earth orbiting satellites, such as GRACE and um, GRACE follow-on, etc., provide us with gravity fields that are very accurate compared to what we need for GNSS processing. The one subtle point here, which is still something which is a research topic, is that the Earth's gravity field, as has been shown with the GRACE mission, Grace mission, is not static with time, it varies. And so there is some issue of whether we should be taking into account time variable gravity in the low order spherical harmonics uh, in the processing of GNSS data. Currently, that is only done for certain uh, secular terms in the gravity field, and the periodic variations and the higher frequency variations are not accounted for at the moment, but that is something that could change in the future. We also have to worry about the attraction of the sun and the moon, and again, because these satellites are high, the um, perturbations from the sun and the moon are actually very similar in magnitude to the perturbations from most of the Earth's gravity field, except for the very low order terms in there. These days, we also take into account planets such as Venus and Jupiter in doing our orbit determinations. Finally, the thing which is most critical in here, and again, the quantities here in brown, they're the ones which we do not model completely. And this is where we have a lot of debate about precisely how to do this, particularly for the GNSS systems. So solar radiation pressure on the spacecraft is a very large effect. Um, and in over a 24 hour period, it can actually move the spacecraft by kilometers. Our basic simple models tend to have errors of the 20 meter level. And we're trying to get these satellite orbits down at centimeter level. And so how you go about estimating the impacts of solar radiation pressure on the spacecraft is a very active research and how you model those quantities. And this is one of the things we'll see keeps evolving in gamut as time goes on as we add new models and new ways of doing that processing. We also have to model the motion of the Earth itself. So you're sitting on the ground, it seems solid, but you're sitting on a rotating planet and the spacecraft are essentially moving in inertial space. Underneath them is rotating the Earth and you have to take that into account. These impacts are very large, uh, five meters, and these have been known about for well over a century. Uh, and so we need to know something how to take into account the rotation of the Earth. Uh, this is typically well done. We have large networks, and so it's not considered a particularly large uh, error in standard processing, unless you're actually interested in understanding how the Earth's rotation varies because of various excitations, etc. We also have lunar solar tides. Uh, those are also large, around 30 centimeters or so typically. And uh, these are considered to be extremely well modeled. And the errors in modeling these terms are probably impacted by our ability to understand the loading term from the oceans. So the ocean tides are much more complicated than the solid earth tides because the oceans flow and there's dynamics in the ocean that affect their variations with time. However, the frequency content of the ocean tides and temporal frequency contribution is the same for both the oceans and the solid earth tides. And so it's very really difficult to separate out at a particular frequency, whether it's a solid earth tide or a loading effect that you are seeing. Again, we are upgrading our ocean load models in uh, gamut and uh, the latest versions that we use we think are sufficiently accurate 
and but they tend to generate some large uh, fails when you use them. Atmospheric loading is a term that's been studied now for many years and again is one where the regular application of this term is not normally done because it's still considered a scientific signal to understand how it's varying and why in some senses we don't fully recover the load that we might expect to see in our signals based on that. The rough rule of thumb for the atmosphere is that a change of surface pressure of one millibar or one hectopascal will change the surface height by about a half a millimeter. And so 20 millibar pressure changes are fairly common. And so you regularly see one centimeter type variations in heights due to this atmospheric pressure loading. By its nature, it's very long spatial wavelength. And so this mostly affects the horizontal components of the position when you view your displacements in what we refer to as a center of figure reference frame. And we'll come back to that concept later as to how we define our coordinate systems when we look at reference systems. Again, theoretically, this should be well modeled because we have extremely good models of the Earth's atmosphere and its surface pressure variations. The thing which is not well modeled and is of similar size uh, and typically lower temporal frequency content is surface water and ice. And these, both of these signals tend to run around 10 millimeters, again, dominated typically in height, although for surface water and ice, when you can have very large masses over very limited areas, the horizontal contribution can be quite large for these. It's been clearly seen near large dams and lakes that fiddle with water, for example, and drain from water, that the horizontal component can be certainly of the same magnitude as the horizontal components in those cases. Again, all of these are active areas of research as to how best to handle them in processing at the moment. So propagation of the signal. So now you know where the things are on the ground, you know where the spacecraft was, and the signal propagates down, and then you have to come through the propagation medium in between the two. And we split this into what's often called the neutral atmosphere, because it has no charged particles in it. And that is the um, uh, composed of what's sometimes referred to as a dry delay or a hydrostatic delay. And the wet delay, which is the water vapor contribution there. The hydrostatic term can be well modeled with surface pressure. And at least when looking directly above you, we think is well modeled. There is an elevation angle dependence that we need to worry about. And that is um, something that, again, there are models that we need to use. And there are simple models and more complicated models depending on precisely how accurately you want your results. The water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere from microwave signals is particularly important because of a dipole component to the water vapor refractivity that makes it very large and typically it can be up to a meter. Errors in the wet delay are considered to be of order centimeters typically. Nearly always in GNSS processing, we need to estimate the atmospheric delays except again, when you're on short separations between your stations, the atmospheric delays at both stations can be the same. And so if you're doing a differential position, they can cancel out. And again, for distances of less than 20 kilometers or so, that can be a good approximation. And again, that is something when we're doing kinematic positioning in track, for example, in Friday, we'll talk more about. The ionosphere is large, uh, but the LC term corrects for it to within a few millimeters most of the time. As we go into high ionospheric activities, there is an approximation in this dual frequency term that has higher order terms associated with the Earth's magnetic field and ray bending. Those generally, again, are a few millimeters. They can be systematic. And so at um, times of high ionospheric activity or in places where you have ionospheric activity like the polar regions and the equatorial regions, this can be important to take into account what's called the second order corrections. We currently do that. We believe those models are relatively accurate. But uh, again, getting down to submillimeter with the sinuspheric correction is actually tricky at the moment uh, using just dual frequency data. However, in terms of variations of things we need to worry about, it's the wet delay is the biggest 
contribution, we believe. And then there's also phase variations on the ground and in the satellite ten antennas. And this is a particularly problematic situation because we have a need for the antennas that we use to be omnidirectional. They need to be able to see all of the sky above them. And that means that they can see reflections off uh, signals which are above the antenna. And also just because of the way electronics is built on them antennas are built, they also see a ground reflection. Again, later on in the class, we'll show some examples of ground reflections, which are very clearly seen in the data. And again, there is calibrations of these uh, antennas. What we don't really have a good handle on is when you take an antenna that you have calibrated in a laboratory type environment or in an in-situ calibration facility, what happens to that antenna when you actually place it on a real monument with all the things around it? And again, often this is a type of correction that will average out as you average many days of data. Again, when you're doing kinematic positioning, it can be more problematic. The satellite antennas are particularly problematic. And it is, again, an area of active research at the moment. And that's because all of our satellite calibrations are done by using data that is collected on the ground and as we'll see, there is scale issues associated with separating the heights of the ground stations from the transmitting locations of the spacecraft. Currently, the International GNSS Service is running a bit large reprocessing effort. And there, they're trying to take into account that the Galileo system has actually anechoic chamber calibrations of their satellite antennas. And we're trying those to see whether those actually accurately reproduce ground station coordinates. Again, we'll talk more about this later on in the class as we go forward. So the basic modeling structure, how do you get all of this into the gamut globe case system? Well, for the satellite orbits, there are IGS tabulated ephemerises. These are in a format called SP3, the third version. Um, and typically, we will use those as our initial starting orbit. Programs like TRAC directly read those uh, orbit files and use them directly. In Gamut, we take these SP3 files and then we fit them using a numerical integration in our program called ARC to model that SP3 file. And so one of the options you have is the type of modeling you do. The most recent versions of Gamut 10.71, our new model that we're recommending, can model these SP3 files to within a couple of millimeters for just about all of the constellations that are there. That does not mean that we can recover the orbits to that accuracy, but it means that our model is numerically able to fit those motions. So ARC is the program which integrates orbits, and that again automatically happens in your processing. And so we never directly use the SP3 files in gamma. In track, we do. The motion of the Earth in inertial space, again, this is done both in model and in track. Model is the gamma program that does high accuracy calculations of the trajectories and the theoretical values for the observables. Track, because it's meant to be used on short baseline kinematic processing, uses somewhat simplified models, but the same basic concepts apply. We can have analytic models for precession and mutations as how the Earth rotates. We also have the International Earth Rotation Service observed values for the pole position, often referred to as Chandler wobble, and the actual rotation of the Earth sometimes called T1. There are also analytic models for the solid earth tides and then for the oceans and atmospheric um, tidal loading, we can use either grid models or we can use site specific uh, information for processing that. This is embedded in the model. Propagation of the signal, again, model and track both have to be able to handle this. For the hydrostatic delay, uh, we need pressure. And we'll talk later on in the class about how accurately you need that pressure. Again, for the most accurate work, we like to use what's called the VMF1 uh, files. These are uh, files generated by the um, uh, generated from numerical weather forecast models, and so provide us with real information about how the atmospheric is varying. This GPT is an analytic version of this in spherical harmonics. It's good if you don't have access to the high precision grid models that you need. The wet zenith delay, this is typically crudely modeled, and so it's always uh, estimated 
uh, in solve, and depending on the length of baseline you're dealing with in track as well. We also need to have the elevation angle dependence of the atmospheric delays. And again, these typically for the highest precision work come from the VMF1 grids, uh, or again, there is an analytic version of that in spherical harmonics. And then the phase center variations for the ground satellites and the ground stations and the satellites come from what's called the Antex file. This is distributed by the IGS, and then we uh, also modify it to add various other uh, antennas that don't fit in the IGS calibration scheme. This is again one file that you need to keep up to date if you're using newer equipment. For the parameter estimation, the phase observations uh, for both solve and track, we form double differences, uh, typically in the ionospheric combination, ionospheric free combination, and the double differences cancels out the clocks in the ionosphere. We do need to apply typically some a priori constraints. Um, we'll see various ways that can happen. And we typically estimate this total zenith delay and real valued uh, ambiguities, the initial phase starting point for the phase measurements. We typically use the Melbourne Wibbana wide lane and ionospheric constraints to be able to try to resolve the difference between the L1 and the L2 phase measurements, and then the actual value of the N1 the L1 phase measurement, and again, if you know L1 and you know the difference, you can calculate what the L2 phase measurement is. This is done in a combination of AutoClean and Solve. So AutoClean is our cleaning program, and we find that doing the wide lane ambiguity resolution in AutoClean is very successful. And then in Solve with the estimator, it basically estimates the floating point N one, the L1 and integer ambiguities, and tries to resolve those to integer values as well. These days, this technique typically resolves more than 90% of ambiguities as we go through. Track uses sort of similar types of algorithms, and um, again, we'll talk more about that, but in track, resolving the integer ambiguities is one of the things that you want to pay very careful attention to. So we estimate the zenith delays, um, and we estimate the coordinates of the stations as we go through. And so the estimation can be a batch least squares, which is done in the um, SOLVE program. In the track, we use a sequential Kalman filter. We'll talk more briefly about that when we talk about globe K later on. So for the results that come out of SOLVE, we end up with a daily position estimate or whatever span of time you've decided to estimate. And we are able then to take the results from SOLVE from individual days, individual networks, individual GNSS systems, and then we are able to combine them together in the program called GLOBE-K. The transition between the two is through a set of files we call H-files, or there are other international standard files we can use as well. And again, GLOBE-K is a sequential Kalman filter, and um, it processes and it looks at the quality of the data as it comes in using a chi-squared increment measurement and allows it to sort of essentially filter out bad data as it's processing. So if we now start looking at the limitations in accuracy as we do these systems, for the signal propagation, the main ones we consider as the things which affect your final position accuracy and how well you do are the signal scattering near the antenna, base center variations and multipath, the atmospheric delays, mainly the water vapor effects. The ionospheric effects are often much smaller provided you're using dual frequency data, but in some cases, there is a limitation in the accuracy due to the second order and higher order terms in the ionospheric noise. And then there's receiver noise. Generally, particularly for 24 hour sessions, we think the actual phase measurement noise is the smallest of the contributions that are there. When you're doing kinematic positioning with track, the receiver noise can be an issue. Although again, this sometimes is actually the impact of the reflections coming into the signal, reflected signals and the multipath that's actually causing your uh, problems. In terms of stations motions, uh, you do need to worry about the monument stability that you have. So if you have an antenna stalled on a tall, thin tower that's able to 
bend associated with groundwater movement around the stations, et cetera, in the sediments, you're not going to have a very uh, stable result. So again, if you're on a building, if the building has a very low aspect ratio and a good basement, it can provide a good stable monument, but not always. We also worry about the loading from the crust and the atmosphere and surface water. And from many GNSS networks of data, again, this can be a very large source of error uh, associated with the um, uh, motion of the ground due to these different loading effects. Unmodeled satellite motions, again, is something we worry about considerably, particularly on large networks. And we'll come back and talk about this. But there are some very subtle impacts of the satellite motions. And you'll hear people talk about a quantity called the draconitic period. This has to do it's with the relationship between the sun and the orbit planes of the spacecraft. And because all of the GNSS systems have very similar characteristics, these draconitic periods are all very similar in their periods. And you see this propagating through signals as you go through. Again, we'll look at that in more detail later on in the class. And finally, reference frame. In terms of your processing and the way you interpret your geophysical results, this is often a very critical issue in being certain that what you are seeing is the motions of the sites relative to something that you actually understand and can be well controlled and understood. So as we've said, this is signal scattering going through. If we now take a quick look, so multipath is the reflection between the direct signal and the far field reflected signal. Most of the time we use geometric optics to look at this, uh, but as you get the reflections very close to the antenna, you may have near field effects. So the way you try to avoid this is you try avoid buildings next to your antennas, reflective surfaces. There is typically a very strong reflection off the ground. And as we'll see in the next slide, the frequency with which that happens is going to depend on how close your antenna is to that reflecting surface. As you observe for many hours, you tend to average this out and you tend to remove it from the average over many days. For the GPS system, there is actually a repeat of this pattern separated by four minutes each day approximately, and you can sometimes take that into advantage. When you're using other GNSS systems like Galileo and GLONASS, that same repeat does not happen. And so you can't take uh, say what's called sidereal filtering into account. So the basic nature of the reflected signals, this is typically stunned by geometric uh, optics, etc. And so as the antenna height is closer to the ground, this is an example of 15 centimeters above the ground. You see that the reflected signal wavelength is quite large. And then as you go to higher and higher heights above the ground, it becomes higher and higher frequency. Interestingly, if the ground is very flat around your site, the magnitude of the reflected signal impact tends to remain fairly constant as you go up in altitude. And uh, so you don't really eliminate the problem, you just simply make it a higher frequency uh, problem as you go through. The antenna phase center patterns are something which these days tend to be very well calibrated and um, they change the effective position where you think the antenna is located. There are various types of antennas and some are very good and some are not particularly good. Uh, one of the most common types of antennas that you see used around the world is called a choke ring antenna. That's what the CR stands for. And then different companies have different versions that they make. This is the uh, Alan Osborne choke ring antenna pattern. And you can see it looks quite symmetric. The units out here are millimeters. So these are five to 10 millimeter impacts. This is at the L1 signal. Um, this is an Ashtec antenna which also tends to have a reasonable pattern, but there are other antennas, particularly as you go to nominally cheaper antennas uh, where the pattern can be quite severe. The other big issue with these types of antennas is how well does each antenna have the same pattern? 
And then how does that pattern behave when you actually place it on a monument? In general, we find that whenever you change an antenna, even if you switch in the same brand antenna and a high quality antenna, you should expect the position to change. And sometimes it can be quite dramatic and often it is in the horizontal components and not just the vertical component as we go through. So we definitely need to use these space center variations. And so these days, all of our processing is done with the phase center variations taken into account. In track, if you're using the same type of antenna and the sites are close together, then this pattern will cancel out when we difference the data. So it is not so critical in track. And um, as you go to very long baselines, thousand kilometers or so, uh, it does start becoming something you should take into account. But for most short baseline processing, using the same antenna type, you can avoid it in track. So for the atmospheric delay, is again very schematically here. One has, typically the water vapor is the largest impact of effects, it tends to be low. And of critical issue here that as the satellites go lower in elevation angle, they pass through more of the atmospheric delay. And so the signal increases. What is called the atmospheric mapping functions is something that we use to predict how does this delay change with elevation angle given a fixed value in the zenith direction. And then what our estimates are doing is determining what is the time variability of this zenith value that best matches the observations we see at different elevation angles. As you can imagine, if you only had satellites near the zenith, that would be difficult to separate. And in particular, you're estimating a clock constant at this ground station. And that clock constant is going to be independent of the elevation angle of the spacecraft. And when you have spacecraft just near the zenith direction, separating the clock from the atmospheric delay and from the height of the station becomes very difficult and highly correlated. We're going to come back to this subtle issue of the impacts of clocks, atmospheric delays, and heights of stations later on when we talk in reference frames because it is one of those characteristics that as people are more interested in studying hydrological loading with GNSS systems in large regional networks, it is something you have to be very careful about in how you go about treating the clock and determining the clock and how you treat what's often referred to as the scale estimates in your network. So in currently this is all done with inversion in track the modeling of the zenith delay variations is through a stochastic process, a random walk process. In gamut, it is done with a piecewise linear polynomial representation. Generally, we find that two hours between the tie points in the piecewise linear function are perfectly adequate for most cases. However, as we'll see later on when we look at atmospheric delays, there are still things about this model which we know we do not model well. And that has to be when one side of this figure has an atmosphere which is very different to the other side of the figure. We can take into account, and we do take into account, azimuthal variation, which is essentially derived from this model if you were to tilt the atmosphere, and so produce higher atmospheres over this side because you tilted this part up. But more complicated variations we do not model well, and we can very clearly see in the data for some stations, there is a strong impact of that. And again, this is an active area of research that we do not understand. Just to give you an example of how some of that variation works, this is uh, from a paper a number of years ago, looking at a uh, location where there was a lot of asymmetry in the atmospheric delay. And so this is estimates essentially of the zenith delay, where we've mapped the individual data points back to an effective measurement of the zenith delay. And it's the top frame is for the total amount of delay, the middle frame is for the water vapor, and then the bottom one is for what we call the hydrostatic delay, or sometimes referred to as the dry delay. And you can see the change in magnitude here. The total delay is of order 2.4 meters, the water vapor contribution here is quite large at about 20 centimeters. These units are millimeters. And you'll see that the asymmetry in the 
hydrostatic delay is actually quite small. All of this variation is occurring in the wet delay. And again, this is a typical case you might see of having thunderstorms to one side of your station and then clear skies effectively on the other station side. And again, this, as I said, kind of as you can tell from the magnitudes here, these are tens of millimeters of effects that our current models typically do not model particularly well. Now, in terms of trying to understand multipath and water vapor effects, etc., we have again several tools that you can use to look at this. And if you're really interested in understanding what's happening in your data, these are what we call sky plots. And so they are representatives of the phase residuals. These are generated from the output from autoclean. And so in these plots, we have azimuth starting here at zero and going around 360 degrees. And then starting from the center, this is directly above you. And as you go radially out, this takes you down to the horizon. The little red bar on these plots typically is 20 millimeters. And so you can see here, that you have fluctuations in the phase residuals. The yellow and the green are just simply positive and negative residuals. And then the red lines are the track the spacecraft are following across the saddle, the sky. So these high frequency variations you see closer to the low elevation angles, these are typically ground reflection multipath signals. And they often will repeat day to day, and clearly they do. Uh, and in other cases, um, we have patterns that develop such as this one out here now on this particular day where the satellite normally is quite smooth across this part of the sky, but here now we're seeing large residuals. We see large residuals down here. And this we consider to be probably an atmospheric modeling error on this particular day. And again, these typically get projected into four hour time slices and so as you look across the sky at different time slices, you can see here the atmosphere was probably well behaved. And then during this time, this is again given as GPS time or close to universal time. And so you can see this is the point at which the atmosphere started to have variation going on that was not well modeled. If it was well modeled, it would not have shown up in the residuals. So modeling the station motions and stability, we'll have a quick look at some of these impacts as we go through. So again, the type of monument used can be quite critical in getting a very high accuracy results, particularly for tectonic studies. Uh, when we're looking at atmospheres, as you saw from the previous slide, our residuals tell us something about the atmospheric delays. And so it is used as a meteorological tool as well. Uh, many of you are interested in that particular aspect of this. Uh, GNSS data. For the geophysics applications, the ground-based geophysics applications, we're trying to keep our monuments as stable as possible. This is the gold standard of monuments, which is a deep drilled braced monument, tripod legs, legs that go quite deep into the ground. So networks like the Networks of the America, NODA, which um, UNAVCO runs across North America, many of the stations are of this style. Uh, this little gray thing here is the ray dome that protects the antenna inside. You'll often see that when you actually look at pictures of these antennas. Other good ones is typically a pin in solid bedrock can be quite good. The drilled brace monument is shown here and low buildings with deep foundations are also tend to be quite good. Uh, not such good at vertical rods, um, buildings with shallow foundations and towers or very tall buildings uh, often due to thermal effects and towers, the thermal effect here is typically um, a bending of the tower or the building because of the asymmetric heating of the body during the sun. Um, we have some interesting results from a very tall building where this is actually 20 centimeters of motion on the building throughout the year just due to thermal warming of one side of it. Now in terms of loading effects, we tend to think of these as divided into atmospheric effects, water and snow effects, and then what's often called non-tidal non ocean loading. This is essentially the loading from the oceans due to currents flowing around. And so depending on where you are in the ocean, they can be relatively large. It tends to be the smallest of the terms that are here. 
And so you see these purple vectors, these are atmospheres. The scale here is five millimeters. So you see across Eurasia in particular, you see these large annual signals. This is very clearly seen in the data. Uh, it is something which, if you look globally, we see this impact um, of a annual pressure variation in um, the atmosphere. And again, large continent areas tend to see it more. The blue vectors here, which can be at times very similar in scale and very large depending where you are. This is the water and snow loading effects. And there is this very common effect that is seen where the Northern Hemisphere during the winter gets heavily loaded with snow and it literally pushes down the whole Northern Hemisphere. And so when you look at where the center of a GPS or a GNSS network is relative to the center of mass of the Earth, there is a very strong annual signal dominated by Northern Hemisphere loading during the winter uh, months, typically. And again, we will look more detailed at some of this later on in the class. Finally, unmodeled satellite motions. This is one of the areas where there's a lot of research going on and particularly associated with the GNSS spacecraft of other constellations as we go through. So this is just a typical satellite of a GPS uh, type. And what you see is these very large solar panels. You see a very large body and you see a complicated transmission antenna down on the spacecraft as we go through. The radiation forces on these solar panels are very, very large, but also the radiation forces on the solar, on the satellite body also can be quite large. And as you go for different constellations, the GNSS systems of Galileo and GLONASS, their satellites have somewhat different characteristics to the GPS spacecraft in that they are lighter, but tend to have the same sort of size, of power, same size solar panels because they have to drive their transmission antennas. And so the force model on these depends on where these solar panels are pointing relative to the sun. And under the nominal your modeling of the spacecraft, the solar panels are supposed to be pointed perpendicular to the direction to the sun. That does not always happen because the satellite can't your fast enough to have that happen all the time. And so the modeling of this radiation pressure particularly as satellites go in and out of eclipse, for example, can be quite difficult. And it is the largest unmodeled error on the spacecraft orbit that we have. When also worries about thrusts of these spacecraft, they're all, act, they're all active satellites. They had used satellite maneuvers. And so we take those into account in terms of typically eliminating the data at which time that is happening. So in Gamut, we have various models that we use for the satellite radiation force model. And one of the things which is very common is that when we want to fit the SP3 files, we use a model that has a large number of parameters in it and is able to match that trajectory very accurately. When you do the estimation of all those parameters in Gamut itself, then the uncertainties become very large because you're estimating a lot of very large, highly correlated parameters. And consequently, the processing, if you're doing orbit determination in gamma, is something you need to be very careful of. And for most users doing geophysical applications, we, we suggest you do not estimate orbits uh, simply because the quality of the IGS orbits is so very, very high as time goes on. And these models that we use evolve with time, and that has impacts on how you potentially would combine your results with the MIT results. This just gives you an idea of the evolution of the quality of the orbits. This, this is a, um, a weighted RMS scatter of different IGS analysis centers around the world. MIT here is in brown. And you can see the evolution back in beginning in 1994 where this plot starts. They were tens of centimeters. Right now, the other GNSS systems are running down a little bit worse than GPS is. As we come through into the recent years, this is up to just recently, uh, we're down below uh, a centimeter or so. And then if you look at uh, the most recent data, and again, these results you can all 
find on the IGS org, IGS um, uh, site in their web pages, etc. And if we look at the most recent data, then uh, we see that this is typically now below a centimeter for nearly all centers as we go through. And what you might notice here, and it's highlighted is MIT here, uh, we were running around about 15 millimeters or so. And then this is the beginning of this year. And what we've done here is we've implemented new orbit modeling software uh, characteristics. Uh, we tuned it a little as we went along. So there were some things we didn't fully understand when we first started, which causes these little blips. But as you can see now, uh, our software is generating uh, orbits which are very consistent with the IGS orbit. That's not necessarily what you precisely want to do because it is simply matching what other people are doing in terms of absolute accuracy. The Scripps Institution of Oceanography is also uses gamut and has been a long-term IGS analysis center. And this recent uh, improvement in their orbit quality is as they uh, implemented the MIT models in the latest version of gamut and were able to uh, uh, get it to run in basically the same mode that we're running right now. And this literally just happened a couple of weeks ago as we go forward. So finally, we're going to come back and we'll talk about reference frames. Again, we have a whole lecture associated with doing this. And so the issue of the reference frames is you have essentially these GPS satellites rotating around here with about approximately a 12-hour period. You have the Earth rotating underneath it with a 24-hour period. And then the question is, how do you go about getting your positions as a function of time to be consistent with the types of problems that you want to understand? Remembering that in this system, because of variations in Earth rotation, the stations are literally moving around by meters. So you might have uh, a set of motions that stations that are well modeled. You might have a block of crust that allows you to interpret those models. And so there's various many different ways you can realize your reference frame as you go through. And we're going to use that to um, look at the different ways that we do that in globe K. And that's going to be addressed in later issues. And finally, just orbit uncertainty and geocentric position uncertainty. This is the fact that typically we are doing differential positioning with gamut, even though we do it globally. Um, and so the error that you have in the uncertainty between the difference in two positions typically depends on that length divided by the error in the satellites over its altitude as we go through. And again, the rough rule of thumb is a 20 millimeter type orbit error will generate something like a one uh, PPB or a one millimeter type error on a thousand kilometer baseline. Now I showed those orbits being consistent within uh, 10 millimeters or so, but that's an RMS number. And as you look at individual satellites, individual satellites have different larger errors depending on their modeling characteristics. And so when you look in a region, all the stations in that region see that same group of satellites that maybe is not being well modeled. And so regionally you can have contributions larger than a millimeter or so, several millimeters of contribution, we think due to orbit modeling errors. And people call this commonly the common mode error in the processing. So in absolute processing, um, we have five millimeters errors or one part per million uh, over accommodation. And then in terms of absolute uh, 20 parts per million for the global uh, situations we go through. And um, again, if you have short sessions of data, you get less averaging and that can be more problematic. So in summary, the GNSS observables that we look at, phase and shooter range, it's important. Oops. It's important to remember the phase relationships and how the amplifying factor is happening. In terms of modeling, multipath and atmospheric delay variations are quite critical. And then on our limitations on GNSS accuracy, monument types, loading, and then orbit quality. And these have improved considerably over the years, but still for longer baselines. And for doing things like absolute height across a continent, uh, these are non-trivial matters that have to be very carefully considered. So now we're going to start going into more detailed um, webinars and sessions looking at uh, precisely how we do all of these things, how we incorporate these in the various programs in Ghana. Thank you.